Good evening and welcome to Have I Got News For You. And if it's Swifty and satire you're looking for, we recommend Jonathan Swift. In the news this week, on a parade ground in the Philippines, a commander-in-chief regrets giving his regiment the night off to go and see Boyzone. <laughs> Close Circuit TV provides the best clue yet to the identity of the Mother Care Ram Raider. And after escaping from a safari park in a stolen car, a baboon gets a taste of his own medicine. <laughs> On Ian Hislop's team, a man who's had more hot dinners than I've had hot dinners, Lloyd Grossman. <laughs> And with Paul Merton tonight, a Labour MP and founder of a political club called the Old Testament Prophets, whose uh, members enjoy good food, conversation and long walks through the Red Sea, Bob Marshall Andrews. <laughs> Round one is how we normally start our descent. Ian and Lloyd, what didn't happen here? Ah, oh, now this is a medical story. Saddam has got some sort of tendonitis. He can't get aid from the West because uh, America and Britain are investing in a huge vibrator, uh, which is being airlifted to Monica Lewinsky for testing. And uh, these guys want to watch. Well, it, it's the, uh, the, the non-war. But you've been in America, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. D it, Desert Storm Junior. Right. But it didn't happen. No. Yeah. Did the Americans report that? They were very keen on the build-up. Yeah, they do like to build up the Americans. It's the war bit they don't want to do so much. <laughs> and what was Britain's involvement? Well, Britain has to do what America says. That's our job. Britain, uh, Britain was going to be a constructive member of the special relationship. Usually it means the Americans say, we're going in. And then they say, by we, we mean British pilots. <laughs> <laughs> Who then fly in and get shot at. Mm, um, and the Americans send in cruise missiles, which don't have any men in them. <laughs> anyway, we, got, we issued another one of these ultimatums. And an hour to go, Saddam said, oh, all right, I'll do whatever you like. So we backed down, and then immediately in the press, Saddam says, I won. There was a headline which I saw upside down in the, in the Times when I was coming in from, uh, from Chatham just before the war was about to start. And it said, um, it said as I read it, it said, outing, outing Saddam Hussein, now key task for West. So I, uh, I thought this is this is a new foreign policy. <laughs> so I, uh, I entirely approve. You can give up the task force and USS Zipper and all that kind of thing, and uh, all you send in is Matthew Paris. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, but I was, I was writing my letter of congratulations to Robin Cook, and I realised it said ousting, which is quite different. No. <laughs> uh, so what was France's involvement? The French. What did they have to do with it? <laughs> They I don't think get that's involved. what I asked you in the slightly more diplomatic term. <laughs> oh, I see. Angus tends to ask the questions and we answer them. Oh, I see. I, see. I, see. I, see. I can't imagine the French had anything to do with it. I no. imagine they supported Saddam. Oh, they must have done. Oh, they leaked the information. They said they're about to bomb you, so give in. So well, they, they, they tipped them off ten minutes before 300 missiles were about to land on Iraq. Uh, and Saddam's response was to send a fax back. <laughs> Just as well it was engaged. Really. <laughs> <laughs> and how did the Sun contribute? They won the war, did they? Uh, effectively, yes, by organising an airlift of Sun newspapers to RAF pilots in Kuwait. What, the petrol station or the country? <laughs> the country, I the believe. Country. <laughs> I, I love the petrol station. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is because page three girls are forbidden uh, by Muslim law in Kuwait. Their idea of a topless woman being one that's just been beheaded, I think. <laughs> Paul and Bob. Um, that's um, that, uh, Derek Shaler, I think is his name. Um, this is, uh, that's the MI5 <coughs> building, just on the Thames there. And uh, there's the severed head of Colonel Gaddafi being passed. <laughs> Through a crowd. Is that the answer? That's the answer. Uh, bits of it, it certainly are, uh, are the answer, yes. Although uh, it wasn't the right name, or, or indeed the right story, but otherwise... <laughs> but cl cl close enough seeing it's, a, it's the early round. Yes, his name is David Shaler, in fact, not Derek Shaler. Oh, that's his brother I'm mixing him up with. <laughs> um, Did he work for MI5? Might have done, we don't know, do we? It's MI5, it's really? secret. So, uh, is Derek... Uh, David Shaler. <laughs> 
Dirk is his nickname. <laughs> and uh, what did Derek do this week? Um, I don't know. I thought it was David. <laughs> I'm calling him by his nickname. No. I don't think he's got a clue. <laughs> no, this is a David Chaler, isn't it? It is, yeah. Who, so, who um, MI5 have tried to gag. He was arrested in France, and France said, oh, we don't know what to do with him. And so they let him go. And they said it's a political issue in France, and MI5 are very worried because uh, he's given away these secrets. He's saying, well, we tried to kill uh, Gaddafi in 96, and if it's reported in a paper abroad, then it can be reported in the papers over here. Effectively mirroring the case with uh, Peter Wright and the scandal that occurred with his uh, particular story ten years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Does that answer your question? <laughs> Now, so if you'd, if you'd done it my way, we'd, we could have avoided all that boring bit. Mm. <laughs> Suddenly it felt like I was on question time for a moment. <laughs> You've got no chance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some of the things he claimed were uh, that MI5 hold files on political subversives. Did he read that list of people who are supposed to be politically subversive? Well, Peter Mandelson was bugged for years, wasn't he? <laughs> And uh, did you read about how he got his job originally? Yeah, he was... I mean, he didn't cut the mustard as a journalist. He was on the Sunday Times, wasn't he? Mm. Good grief. <laughs> and he went from there to join our intelligence services. <laughs> but he actually found the job in a classified section. Oh, did the he? newspaper, yeah. What did he say? Wanted spy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it said, uh, waiting for Godot, question mark. Really? Mm. I suppose if you're clever enough to realise that means we want spies, then... Uh... Why does that mean we want spies? It's a code. You can't code. say we, w we want spies. I suppose that wouldn't, wouldn't be code, would it? No, it wouldn't be a code. Mm. You've got to say waiting for Godot. Fish finger slightly used. Fifteen quid. <laughs> <laughs> Always wonder what that advert meant. <laughs> they should bring it up, I do. <laughs> In October, David Shaler publicly revealed that MI5 compiled hundreds of dossiers on prominent individuals, including Trade Secretary Peter Mandelson, although obviously any personal information about him is known purely to the Secret Services and viewers of ITV and Channel 4. <laughs> uh, Ian and Lloyd, your uh, recorded material. This is Monica Lewinsky, who's released the audio tapes this week, or they've been released, of her phone conversations with Clinton. Um, this story has just been going on for so long, I can't remember if I was born when it started. <laughs> anyway, now it's going on so long that Andrew Morton has got involved. He wrote the book on Diana and he's now going to write a book on Lewinsky. And it's going to be written by February, apparently. It's going to be out in the shops by February, so he's obviously spending more time on this one than normal. And <laughs> um, what were the, some of the burning issues of the day discussed during this conversation? Lloyd. You've just been in America. What were they on about? Yeah, I don't know. They just talked sort of uh, lovey-dovey stuff mm. about... I don't know. What are you going to talk about? You could do a good through the keyhole, wouldn't you, with Monica Lewinsky's house? <laughs> yeah. Whose stained dress is this? <laughs> <laughs> Here's a cigar by the bed. <laughs> I wonder why it won't light. <laughs> I, I, I'd always assume she kept it in the tube. <laughs> I was actually going to uh, suggest that we listen to a bit of the tape. We didn't have sex. Well, what do you call it? We fooled around. Oh. Sex? Oh, I don't know. I think if you go to if you get to orgasm, that's having sex. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. It's, it's not, not having sex. Is having intercourse. Uh, you've been around him too long. That's his. Uh, -uh. That's, well, that's my. Then I've had sex with a lot more people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and then Linda gave the advice to Monica. I'd be careful what you say on the phone, um, particularly at this testing, testing time for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the tapes reveal Monica's feelings for the president. According to the Mirror, she fell in love with him the first time she looked into his eyes. Mind you, that was three months into the relationship. <laughs> And uh, finally, Paul and Bob. This is Lord uh, Irving of Leg, the one and Lord Chancellor and interior decorator. <laughs> That's and, the uh, credit sequence from the bill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the story is, um, is about uh, Lord Irving of uh, Leg, who has been stung 
stung by repeated criticism from Riff Raff, like me, <laughs> um, <coughs> that, his, um, that his, learn, his office is, uh, is an anachronism, a 1,200-year-old anachronism, and that um, it's not, not entirely right um, that he should, as an unelected person, be running the country, um, <laughs> having been put into power by his old chum. Uh, the Prime Minister. So, um, stung by this, uh, this repeated criticism, he is now going to put an end on it uh, by wearing trousers. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's off with the britches, up with the trousers, and down with the dissidents. <laughs> <laughs> Did you once offend uh, Lord Irvin? I once told a joke um, in his presence. <laughs> Um, do you want to hear what it was? Yeah, yeah. you do, don't you? Yes. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> no, it was, um, it was before, it was during the election campaign in the, um, in the River Cafe. And um, John Mortimer was going to make the speech and, and he bottled out. So, um, so but halfway through it, uh, I said a lot of things are going to change under New Labour, but one thing looks as though it's going to remain exactly the same. It, and that is the character of the Lord Chancellor. It looks as though we're in for another Presbyterian, ascetic, teetotal Scot. Well, a Scot, anyway. <laughs> he liked the joke. <laughs> uh, so who were some of the opponents? There were one or two who spoke out against it. Really? Yeah, Baroness Young said, uh, why not go the whole way and wear a t-shirt and jeans? Well, that's typical, isn't it? Didn't she? <laughs> <clears throat> In what way? It's new Labour, isn't it? <laughs> Only she's not. Is she not New Labour? No. <laughs> We're well, highly trained, not to say more than that. <laughs> <laughs> You've done pretty well so far. <laughs> so, uh, at the end of that round, well, not for the first time, the difference between the two teams is completely pointless, with four each. <laughs> so, in the absence of any cabinet ministers, let's out an odd one. Four closet odds to choose from. Paul, uh, Richard Whiteley, Jerry Springer, Ken Livingstone, and Sooty. Has it got anything to do with, oh, I don't know, um, uh, fights, uh, violence on screen, anything to do with that? I think this is to do with being mayor. Yeah. Being yeah. mayor? Yeah, well, there are a lot of yeah. mayor. Jerry oh, Springer yeah. was mayor. Sooty's yeah. mayor of Blackpool. Sooty was Sooty mayor of Blackpool. Sweep, Sweepsville. Ken Livingstone's the odd one out, he's never been mayor of anywhere. Uh, Sorry, that's... Ian, what were you saying? <laughs> Sooty was made Mayor of Blackpool because it was 50 years ago uh, this summer that uh, Harry Corbett found him in a little toy shop. How extraordinary. You appeared in a Sooty show, didn't you? I did. It was great. Mm. So, what, are you playing the part of a travelling salesman who was trying to sell <laughs> Sooty gloves? That's right. No. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> Could you hang on to the hat? Could you that was my hat. I bought that with me. And he hasn't still got it because I've got it here. <laughs> That's not the same one. Well, they gave it to us. So well, I've got mine at home. Look, it was, look, that's not the same object at all, look. <laughs> so I should wear it for the rest of the show. Right, I'll take on and off well. quickly and they will have a hell of a job editing the programme. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so how do we... <laughs> uh, what was Jerry Springer, mayor of? He was mayor of Cleveland? Or Cincinnati? Cincinnati, one of those. Cincinnati yes, same thing. Good. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> well, and... Um, uh, <laughs> Richard Whiteley, you haven't dealt with him yet? Well, he's, he has been mayor of somewhere, and Ken's the odd one out because he wants to be mayor of London, but Tony doesn't want him to be. Yeah, so on the subject of Ken, what, uh, what is he going to have to face if they, they've suddenly decided they're going to put him in front of a... They've Fire changed the rules. <laughs> <laughs> committee, in fact. The uh, Suitability Scrutiny Committee. He's going to have to... They're putting him in front of a vet, aren't they? <laughs> it's going to happen to all of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is true. Before the next election, you're going to have to go in front of a, a reselection panel, aren't you? Oh, and we're ready like a cold spring. They say they're going to root out MPs who attack the government every five minutes. Yes. I can't imagine what kind of idiot would do that, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> so is it true that Labour has a dossier then all the, on all the troublesome MPs? Peter Mandelson produced a list very shortly after the election. There were 40 new members of Parliament on it. 
one of whom's got two PhDs and was, dis was described as me mentally unstable. <laughs> and um, I was on it too. There was a problem because, I mean, the press don't realise the, the terrible trouble that they cause when they, when they publish lists like the Sunday Times published the list. And uh, there were members of the Parliamentary Labour Party, who I know, who were close to suicide when they realised their names weren't on it. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, your four heavenly creatures are a pigeon, mm. a mm. rhino, mm. Geoffrey Robinson, and yourself. <laughs> it's the rhino. It's definitely the rhino, because the rhino is the only troublesome pest that they're not trying to get rid of from the House Commons. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we're permanently trying to get rid of the pigeons. We, um, mm. we put destabilising ointment on the, uh, on the ledges. Sort of similar to what we're doing to the Liberal Democrats. Really. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and Geoffrey, well, they're just trying to get rid of him um, because he f forgets things like money. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> And me, um, well, they're just trying to get rid of me. I have absolutely no idea why uh, 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 mm -hmm. at all, because I'm totally loyal and decent. And mm -hmm. I'm also, and I want to, I want to bring this out now, I'm also an active practicing heterosexual. <laughs> uh, not much, not much. Right. <laughs> but, uh, but now and again, I've, I've tried to do something about it, but I can't. <laughs> That's why it's the rhino. Mm. Do you want a clue? Yes. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> the clue can be, in fact, for Lloyd. And the question is, uh, who would live in a house like this? Yeah, I, You're lost for words. I don't believe it. <laughs> is it a pair of military wing of the Teletubbies? <laughs> I've never seen it. I mean, it... is this where you live, Bob? It's a bunker. This is, in fact, Bob's home, yes. Wait, You're pretty paranoid about Manderson, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Is it popular with the neighbours? Yes. <laughs> There's one neighbour who said it was like the flight deck of SS Enterprise. Name them. <laughs> Um, so, uh, given that this is a clue, uh, what do you think the answer might be? Pigeon. <laughs> oh, I know. We give up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the answer is that they all live in listed buildings, uh, with the exception of Bob Marsh and Andrews. Yeah. Because the pigeon uh, lives uh, in a listed building. Its loft was listed by the local council. What, that um, particular pigeon? <laughs> It's not just a picture of any old pigeon. No, that is Jeremy the pigeon who lives in <laughs> one of these. How lots. did he come by the Subaquet, Jeremy? After Paxman, <laughs> pecks people to death. Um, this is a better answer than the one I gave. Uh, I'm beginning to doubt it. So, uh, <laughs> uh, and the Rhino House at London Zoo uh, has been designated a Grade Two listed building. Uh, this week, Geoffrey Robinson apologised to Parliament for not disclosing all his business interests almost exactly a year after the discovery of his £12 million worth of shares in a tax-free bank account in Guernsey. Uh, Robinson denied that this was to avoid paying UK tax. Obviously, Guernsey just happened to be the most convenient branch for his home in government. <laughs> uh, Lloyd, Ron Davies, Sir Ranulph Fiennes, John Burt, and Romulus and Remus. <laughs> Does Bob really live in that house? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, Romulus and Remus are Italian. I think the other three are all Welsh. <laughs> Is it being brought up by wolves? It's not quite that simple, Ian, no. <laughs> Do three of them get their milk delivered to their doorstep? <laughs> It has something to do uh, with part of Ron Davis's brother's uh, defence that was in... Um... It's an unpleasant father, isn't it? The Ron Davis, but as his brother said, you know, they're very unpleasant upbringing. Their father was an extremely awful, horrible man. Um, the uh, Ranulph Fiennes, his father was... Uh, well, I mean, anybody who calls somebody Ranulph was just... <laughs> it was a saint, basically. And um, Romulus and Remus, now, who, were they? who abandoned them? They were thrown away. So John Burt's the odd one out, he's got a nice dad. 
is the wrong answer. Uh, but you're in the right area. Uh, the answer is that they all claim to have been beaten as children, uh, with the exception of Romulus and Remus. Saranoff was beaten by Jonathan Aiken. At school. They, yeah, he was a prefect at Eton. Um, he would have been at school with Paul then. Were you beaten when you went to Eton to buy the tie? That's the beginning of a limerick, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I had an escape that was narrow in Harrow. <laughs> Sir Ranulf uh, described the horrors of life at Eton. Boys were bullied for countless reasons. Uh, if their noses were bulbous, their hair ginger, their accents different, or their voices squeaky. Thank God Robin Cook didn't go to Eton. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, finally in this round, Ian. Mohammed Al Fayed, Chairman Mao, Jeremy Bentham, and Snow White. Well, this is uh, about embalming yourself. Al Fayed has just announced, one of his more sane announcements actually, <laughs> um, that he's going to have himself stuffed and mounted in a glass case on the top floor of Harrods. So this is true. Although I'm... So he can s stand there on the top floor and look over all his employees, which makes a change from bugging them. <laughs> but at the moment people will say, oh yes, of course, we'll do that. We'll, you know, we'll do that. And when he dies, we'll say, I'll bung him in the skit. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, you can see there's Jeremy Bentham. He was sort of mummified and stuffed in a glass case. Mm. And Mao was um, mummified and put in a glass case. And Cinderella, uh, interestingly, was... No, that's Snow White. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> How stupid of me. Mm. Anyway, she was, um, she was still alive <laughs> when the dwarves put her in the case. So they were dead and she was alive. Is that right? Uh, is the right answer. Yes, oh, very good. You. Well done. Um, good. Uh, Snow White's never been alive. No, More Richard. sooty, but I didn't tell you. Wash <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>, your mouth. <laughs> they've, they've all had their bodies on display in glass cabinets, is the, is the answer, with the exception of Mohammed Al Fayed. Uh, so Ian didn't right. get the right answer then? Uh, yes, he, he was very there. But he Snow White. Oh, did you? Oh, well, then you can't have all the points. <laughs> yes, yeah, so you can have one for the reason, but you can't have one for getting so the right So, what was your that. reason that they've. They've all been displayed except been, him who will be. Uh, yes, he was asked to be when he dies, but he's not dead right, yet. I'd better take up Paul's argument. Cinderella is not real. <laughs> I know it's no one. No, no one. <laughs> <laughs> In his will, uh, philosopher Jeremy Bentham left his body to medical students at University College London, which explains how it turned up in the Dean's bed during Rag Week. <laughs> Which utterly lifeless display means that at the death, Paul and Bob are currently being slaughtered. 7 6. <laughs> and so to the final flurry of mental agility that our missing words round so rarely produces. So, to your marks for Queen Beats Spice Girls in what? Lesbian mud bath. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see it on News at 10? Uh, no, uh, it is in fact the internet chart. Yeah. Uh, oh, this is the Queen's new website, Ooh, which receives over four million visitors a week. A palace spokesman said the Queen reads the messages we receive very carefully. Yeah. Next. <laughs> uh, worms hired to what? Is it beat up earwig? Is this earwig going around causing trouble? <laughs> Ladybird's got any action, you know, worms go and beat him up. He goes down this way on Friday night. Jump out on the earwig, beat him up, give him a good talk, you know what I mean? No uh, questions asked. Uh, make more room in cemeteries. Uh, well, they might... <laughs> uh, no, eat waste eat is waste. Uh, the answer. This is uh, Huddersfield Council who is hiring them. You how do, do, you, how do you hire a worm? Through an agent. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> um, <laughs> Where do worms live for an extra point? Leicester. <laughs> No, the zoological term for where worms live is... Vermicularium or something like that. Almost. A vermicularium. Vermicelli. A vermicularium. No, a wormery. Next, the fridge with what? A degree in psychotherapy. Attitude. Come on, open up. It's not a fridge with attitude, no. Uh, the fridge with cold things in it. Uh, it is, in fact, uh, a fridge with a brain. 
Uh, this is a new computerized fridge. Oh, we don't care. Coke, keep going. Uh, that will uh, tell you when your milk is off and well, when to reorder your eggs and can even flash messages across your computer screen at work, uh, which could be kind of dangerous if you work at the stock exchange. It suddenly says, buy sugar. <laughs> <laughs> Next, uh, Europe's biggest what is heading for Britain? Homosexual. <laughs> is it wasp? Uh, no, although you're in the right area. Killer bee. Uh, it is in fact woodpecker. How, how big is it? Is it impossible to stop? <laughs> Twelve foot high woodpecker coming through customs. Get out of it. And uh, finally, the full what? Monarchy. 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 Exactly. And what is this a reference to? It's the fact that the two princes got up and did the uh, strip at the, um, at the, the they did a bit from the film. Wasn't it just Charles? Oh yeah, well, he, he stood in the line and did a little bit of dance as well. But the princes as well, they did apparently, they did a sort of take off in the, uh, at the Royal Party, one of the several Royal Parties he's had this week. Have you been to any of them? No, I wasn't invited. Mm. Were you? No. <laughs> is uh, that true? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> you were invited? Might have been. Uh, this uh, didn't go. Did you get yeah. invited? Uh, no. Well, where comes this ponce here gets invited? <laughs> <laughs> Talking of which, are you a member of the Garrick? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and are those your own teeth? <laughs> we'll ask you the question for a change. I've had eight years of listening to you spouting off. <laughs> um, no, why? Do you ask? Someone saw you in there the other day. My girlfriend's father is a member of the Garrick. Right. I haven't been blackballed yet. You should have a word with your girlfriend then. <laughs> <laughs> I recommend right. creosote. Thank you. <laughs> Keeps the woodpeckers away, I can tell you. <laughs> you can't stop it. Back to the hilarious uh, royal takeoff of the hit film, The Full Monty. Makes you feel sorry for Charles, doesn't it? What a rotten job being the heir to the throne, sitting around going. <laughs> <laughs> Which manic ramblings mark the end of tonight's seizure, and the madness of it all is that this week's dumb waiters are Ian and Lloyd with eight, while this week's master chefs are Paul and Bob with nine. And I leave you with news that police are to step up investigations after discovering more victims of the man known only as the Abbey National Murderer. <laughs> <laughs> Jack Cunningham checks the latest consignment for the Home Secretary's son. <laughs> and at St Anne's Convent, Winchester, there's a worrying sight at the back door. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> <laughs>